Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 9 through 20. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 9 through 20. And then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. And then I said to them, you see the trouble that we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. This is God's word, you may be seated. Well, the story continues. It's just an amazing story that we're looking at in the book of Nehemiah. And as we've seen in previous works, the purpose of this story in the Bible is to teach us to remember how to rebuild. So God's people have been sent into exile. 70 years, and then according to the promise of God through his prophet Jeremiah, they'd returned from exile and had started to rebuild. They rebuilt the temple. But the work had stopped, the walls had not been rebuilt, and word came to Nehemiah, cupbearer to the king of Persia, Artaxerxes, about the fact that the walls had not been rebuilt. There was great trouble and shame, and Nehemiah heard this, and as we saw the first week, he started with prayer. And remember how to rebuild, it starts with prayer. We got again on our knees and say, God, we need your help. Lord, will you work powerfully again in this day, even now? And he started with prayer. We saw that the first week, but then it took courage. He was in the presence of King Artaxerxes, this dictator, this man who had his life and his death in his hands. And yet he realized that really he was in the hand of the sovereign God and he prayed to the God of heaven to give him the right words, the right courage at that moment and God blessed him and used him and with that courage, he then begins this journey and we pick up the story and so there, he is. Now we're coming to the next thing and we called it establish reality. Remember how to rebuild. Start with prayer, take courage, and then now this morning establish reality. And to begin with, there is immediately conflict, verses 9 and 10. I, then I came to the governors of the province beyond the, 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 province beyond the river, that is trans-Euphrates, that is the province that Israel, Jerusalem is placed within in the Persian Empire, and I gave him the king's letters. He had the authority, the written authority from the king to do what he's going to do, and he presented that to the governors. 
But not only that, he also, the king, had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. So he had written authority, but he also had symbolic authority. He had the princes. Can you imagine they're all in their Persian regalia, the military force, the cavalry had turned up with Nehemiah. He symbolically, as well as legally, had the authority and the power of the Persian king behind him. But there's immediately conflict, verse 10. But when Sambalat, the Horonite, uh, we know from later uh, documents that Sambalat, the Horonite, was later the governor of this region. He may well have been one of the governors or the governor already at this time, certainly an important official at least. When Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah the Ammonite's servant. Now probably when it says servant here, it isn't indicating that he's a sort of lowly slave. What it's indicating is that he's a high-ranking official. He's a staffer. So you have Sambalak, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Horonite, who's one of the, the, the governors, certainly later, perhaps now, and you have one of his high-ranking staffers with him. Sambalak the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, heard this, it displeased them greatly, or literally, the Hebrew loves to um, uh, repeat for emphasis, evil to them, evil big. It displeased them greatly. That someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel, and you say, why, why should it displease them? Well, because it's a power game. They have authority over Samaria, Samaria is the capital of Trans-Euphrates, the province behind, uh, beyond the river. Jerusalem is under their thumb, and they don't want Jerusalem to rise again. It's evil to them, evil big. Displease them greatly. There's immediately conflict. Now, when you, this morning, say to God, I am going to rebuild my life. I'm going to put behind me that sin. I'm going to commit to God again. And you walk out that door, expect conflict. Fears within, conflict without. O oh, Lamb of God, I come. You'll have trouble in this world. But take heart, he who is within you is greater than he who is in the world. It is an inevitable thing that when we follow Jesus with all our heart, mind, and soul, we will have conflict. Think of it like a river, a stream. What goes with the flow? What is it that has no conflict? A dead branch. What kind of fish does never fl uh, swim against the flow of the river? Only a dead fish? But if you're alive spiritually, you'll swim against the flow and there'll be pressure, conflict. Why? Because you're following God and those around you want to pull you down. Expect conflict. So there was conflict. Uh, but then also, uh, Nehemiah, who throughout this book comes across as an extremely wise leader, Nehemiah does his homework. He is prepared. Conflict, then preparation. This is verses 11 to 16. So he goes to Jerusalem. He's there three days. And I think the inspection that he makes on uh, the Jerusalem walls, I think happens probably over three nights. Certainly the word night is repeated three times in these verses. So verse 12, then I arose in the night. I and a few men with me, he's going secretly. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. He's keeping it quiet for now. Only one animal with him. He's not coming of the huge cavalry. He's going by night in secret. Where does he go? He goes by night, I think probably the, the, the second night, but it could be the same night. We don't know for sure. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem. That word inspect is repeated again in verse 15 on the third night. I inspected the wall. It means a close examination. In its roots, it has this idea even of a medical examination, like putting your finger in the wound to figure out what's really going on. He's doing an MRI on the walls. He's doing a CAT scan. He's really trying to figure out what's happening. He's making a very close inspection. 
Uh, these gates, we don't know exactly where they all uh, were. In prob all probability, they're on the southern eastern side of the city, and that's because these, these gates, the Fountain Gate, the King's Pool, the Dragon Spring, are probably near the Kidron Valley where the water was. And the Dung Gate, which is a rather enigmatic uh, name, but it, it means that this is the city gate that goes to the municipal uh, dump. It's the trash heaps are outside. This is where if you've got trash, you take it out through that gate. But he inspects those that have been destroyed by fire. And then verse 14, he finds in one place there's no room for the animal that was under me to pass. This is really, it's, the, the rubble has built up. There's no space. And so he has to turn back and he returns. And then verse 16, he underlines this is secret. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who would do the work. No one knew. But he makes a very careful inspection by night. He does his homework. He's prepared. He sees it with his own eyes. He puts his hand on the wall to feel what it's like. He does an inspection. Now, this is an important principle. It's an important principle for leaders, for parents, for students, for anyone. See it with your own eyes. Uh, Winston Churchill, I've, I've read um, a few bi biographies of Winston Churchill uh, over the years, and I haven't come across this incident in one of those biographies, but most of the biographies I read were about the Second World War, and this took place afterwards. So it's possible it happened, but it's in, in one of the movies about Churchill. So it, it could have happened, though I don't know for sure. But there was a time in Winston Churchill's, uh, when he was prime minister, when there was a very um, intense smog over London. In the old days, they didn't have rules about what you could burn in fireplaces in the houses in London, so there could be terrible smog. And the weather was so bad that, because London's in a bit of a, a valley, it can, the, the, the air can kind of cluster down there, and there was a terrible smog. And people were dying through the, the bad air. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't get enough uh, oxygen in their lungs, and the hospitals were starting to fill up. And they were coming to Churchill as the prime minister to do something. And Churchill was just saying, look, it's the weather. There's nothing I can do about it. And he just ignored it. And then in the story, one of his secretaries, one early morning coming to work, stepped out uh, into the road and was hit by a bus because she couldn't see uh, the bus because so, the smog was so bad you couldn't see. And she was rushed to hospital. Churchill, being a good leader, one of his staff is in hospital. So he rushes over privately. No one knew. None of his officials. He just went to make sure she was okay in hospital. He got to hospital and found that she died. And then he started to look around at all these people who were suffering, at all the real impact that was taking place. He saw it for himself. He immediately called a press conference, turned around the policy. You've got to see it for yourselves. Look, parents, don't rely on the church to nurture you your children, you, you've got to be involved yourself. It's your responsibility. Look, we have, I think, some of the best, if not the best, uh, children's and youth programs around. But you've got to be involved yourself. Students, don't, don't only read like second, third-hand resources. You, you've got to get to the manuscripts. You know, when I was doing first-hand research, I was amazed at how few of some of the big-name scholars had actually read the manuscripts. You've got to get into yourself. Like, you have to take responsibility for your own life. Don't rely on me to, to make you like the best Christian you can possibly be. Read the Bible yourself. Go to the source. That's what he did. He was, he was prepared. So he, uh, there's immediate conflict, but he does his preparation. And then from verse uh, 17 uh, to 18, he calls for commitment. Then I said to them, that is all the, the, the Jewish people in, in the city, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burnt. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. Now, in this part where he's calling for commitment, Nehemiah is just brilliant in the way he does it. Every part of this is so carefully picked 
for maximum impact. And here, in this verse 17, he repeats two words, trouble, you see the trouble we're in? And at the end of verse 17, that we may no longer suffer derision. And these two words are exactly the same words that at the beginning of Nehemiah in verse three, chapter one, are what, what was reported to him. He says, they're in great trouble and shame. And in Hebrew, it's the same word, derision. So what he's saying is, what was told to me is exactly what it is. I've seen it for myself. Come on, it's true. This is reality. But not only that, those two words are exactly the same words that the prophet Jeremiah, remember I told you that Jeremiah, under, uh, through God's word through Jeremiah, predicted that 70 years would come and then they would return and then they would re rebuild. These two words are exactly the same words that the prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah uh, 24 verse nine, used to describe what would happen and that afterwards there'd be a rebuilding. And what Nehemiah is saying is, this is all part of the story. God has a plan and he's placing them in the biblical story, how important that is. What story are you placing yourselves in? The story of the decline of Western civilization? The, the story of what your parents said to you? The, the story of, I'm such a bad person, I can never do anything. Place yourself in the biblical story. Yet yeah, you see the trouble and derision. Yeah, you, I, I am a sinner, you are a sinner. But the story of God, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. That's the story. That God has a plan. As Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not, shall not prevail against it. That's the story. That one little mustard seed sown in the ground will produce a tree so big that it will, the kingdom of God will grow and Christ will return. That's the story, Jeremiah is saying. But what is more, verse 18, he says, I told them that the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And we've seen how already this is a phrase that Ezra uses about God's providence, the hand of God's blessing and that, that Nehemiah had used. And what he's saying is what God did through Ezra when the temple was rebuilt, God is now at work again. He's at work. He told him about how, what God had done to orchestrate the, 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 the events through what he had heard and through King Artaxerxes. And he, he told him about the evident signs, the breadcrumbs of what God is doing. I told them of the hand of my God. It's Aslan is on the move. And also the words that the king had spoken to me. He also tells them, look, I have the authority. And they said, okay, let's rise up and build. They were committed. Would you commit? Will you commit to Christ? Will you put your hands in his hand? Will you commit to this church, become a member, get involved, help with volunteering? Will you commit to tell your friends about Jesus? Let's rise up and build, Nehemiah says. Will you rise up and build or are you just gonna let the opportunity pass you by? They committed. Now, in fairy tales, that would be the end of it, but it, it isn't in Nehemiah, it isn't in real life. And immediately, uh, there is criticism. Verses 19 and 20. But when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Immediately there's criticism. 
Sambal, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, we've heard about them already, but now the thing is snowballing. The criticism and building, the tweet has been sent and it's been forwarded and there are comments underneath. And now we have Geshem the Arab as well. And they jeered at us and they despised us. Uh, criticism. How do you deal with criticism? One thing that is helpful is to remember that when you're criticized, someone learns. If the criticism is wrong, then the other person has something to learn. If the criticism is right, then you have something to learn. They're jeering at him and despising him. Now, this criticism is, is unfair. It's not true. And what they're saying is, what is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? That's a strange accusation. He's presented to them that the letters that he has of authorization from the king, he has all the Persian authority behind him. He has the, the princes of the realm and the cavalry with him. Clearly, he's got the king on his side. Why are they saying, are you rebelling against the king? Could be they're trying the same tactic that was tried beforehand in Ezra chapter 4 when they accused them of rebelling against the king. Could be that. Could be that what they're trying to get Nehemiah to do, they're trying to pin him on the horns of a dilemma. If Nehemiah now claims that he's only doing it because the Persian king has told him to do it, then his authority will be undermined in the, in the eyes of the Jerusalem people. If, on the other hand, he denies that it's the, the, the Persian king's authority, then, then he's rebelling against the king, which is a very serious charge. Should you pay taxes to Caesar or not? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar, and to God what is God's. And Nehemiah says, I've got a higher authority. The God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. No portion. That's referring back to Joshua, when the tribes were portioned a part of the promised land. You're not, you're not a part of that, he's saying. No right, that, that is, they have no moral righteousness to be a part of what God's doing, or claim. That is, no traditional memorial in the city. What he's doing is what we find it so hard to do. He's drawing a line in the sand. He's demarcating who's in and who's out. All Scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We like the teaching and the training. We find the rebuke and the reproof difficult. But not only that, he's actually saying, Sambal at Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, Gesh and the Arab, you're not a part of God's people. He's exercising discipline. You're on the outside. And there are times when churches need to do that. They need to say, this kind of behavior, this kind of action is putting you outside of what the Bible would define as Christian. You have no portion or right or claim this isn't what God is about, this abusive criticism. And so he establishes reality. He goes there himself, even secretly, to see for his own eyes. You know, sometimes you have to do that. I remember when um, at another church that I was uh, serving, there was a particularly complicated pastoral situation. And uh, one member of the family had um, been put into a secure mental institution, secure mental hospital. And for various complicated reasons, 
It wasn't crystal clear to me that that person needed to be there. I wasn't 100% sure that there wasn't some maneuvering, manipulation going on behind the scenes. So I decided I had to check it out myself. So I went to this secure uh, mental institution, a uh, guard at the gate, and said, uh, my name is Pastor Josh Moody, I've come to see such and such. And the person said, sorry, you can't come in. So I went away and thought about it. I really need to see this with my own eyes, and I prayed about it. <laughs> and then I came back the next day, and I put on my best clothes, and I stood before the guard, and I looked in the eye and said, it's Dr. Moody for so-and-so. He let me right in. Day after day, week after week, I go to the guard and say, Dr. Moody for so-and-so, let me write in. After about a month, he looked me in the eye and said, what do you have your doctorate in? I said, historical theology. He said, oh, come on. I said, well, you know. So I didn't get back in next week. But I saw it for my own eyes. I was involved myself committed myself. A great king has sent someone to you that you might rebuild your walls. He came with angels, cohorts of armies of heaven proclaiming him. He went to Jerusalem. Three days and three nights. Died. Rose again. And he looks at his disciples. Come, let's rebuild. Are you in? Are you committed? Our oh Lord God, we do pray that you would help us to be the kind of people who are committed to your work, not passive, but involved. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your great leader, Nehemiah, and the greater Nehemiah to come, Jesus, to lead us forward in your rebuilding of this of this truth, of this life, of your people, of our own lives. And by your spirit, we pray you'd help us to rebuild. In the name of Jesus, amen.